we face a lot of these issues mm-hmm. you know, in the community. But when my daughter was, I think I, I wrote a poem about it when she was around three years old, where she was told in the class that her hair, her hair stinks and hair cream. Like the, the whatever you are putting in the hair, you know. Someone told your yeah, daughter the, her hair yeah, stinks. Yeah, 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 the, yeah, the teacher brought it to our attention. What, what that, race was this? They, they, they were white, you know, right? So they brought it to our attention that, oh, the hair is, you know, the, the hair cream. They don't want it in, in the class because they yeah, yeah. So how did you feel hearing that? Yeah, I felt and someone say that about yeah, just, you. Just just wrote a poem about it. That was where I could you didn't go over to punch the person. You just express. On today's episode, we have a multiple award-winning poet and storyteller, best known for his collection of poems, "Dead Lions Don't Roar." His name is Tolu A. Akinyemi, but he's popularly known as the Lion of Newcastle. Welcome to our studio, Tolu. <laughs> <laughs> so, Tolu, why are you so obsessed with lions? Ah, uh, because lions are, are kings. Mm-hmm. They leave their imprint on the sands of time. They are renowned for you know their strength, their their power, and I believe that for also we need to roar. We need to like before we leave this stage of of life, mm-hmm. we need to make. You know, let people know that we came to the world by doing something remar- remarkable. Okay. Yeah, so I think I am the lion of Newcastle. <laughs> oh, why are you called the lion? So who named you lion of Newcastle? Oh, how did you get that name? Yeah, so when I released my first book of poems, Dead Lions Don't Roll in 2017, mm. and when I, you know, go out to perform, and, you know, I encourage the audience to roar with me, roar, everyone. You know, when I come on stage, people are roaring and, you know, it was just, it was crazy. I can imagine that. You know, everyone coming, you know, everyone is roaring, everyone is crazy, you know, going mad, the atmosphere is crazy. Then at some point, even without me prompting the audience, everyone is roaring, roaring. you know. So there was always this, like, high performance, energy in the crowd. Everyone is happy, you know. Everywhere, everywhere is just alive, you know. The lion is here, the lion is here. Mm-hmm. And from there, you know, I I, I got a, the name the, lion. the lion of Newcastle. Newcastle. And, you know, to become the lion of Newcastle, you actually have to prove that you're, you're a true lion. Mm-hmm. And I think over the years, I've proved, you know, with the books I've published, the spaces I've performed mm-hmm. in, I've proved to to, to be the true lion of Newcastle, 22 books on uh, oh, 22 books. I was about to say that you've done a lot, a lot of writing. Yeah. But what actually inspired you to go into writing, go into poetry? Was that always your dream? Yeah, so I think I I grew up in the home where language was like at the front burner. Mm-hmm. My dad studied English and literary studies mm. at the at the prestigious University of Ibado. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, that that university is so good. Like yeah. back then so many like top yeah. people went there. Yeah, so so that studied English and literary studies. Mm. So obviously in the house we had a lot of books, mm. the Achebes, the Dio Fagunwas, the Michetas, Elichia Madis, you know. A lot of books in the house or keyboards and all of that. And my mom was a teacher as well. Wow. My mom taught French and Yoruba language. So everywhere we everywhere in the house, you no know, language. Where where it's not French is <laughs> Yoruba. Wow. Where it's not Yoruba is English language. Mm. So there was, you know, it was just it was beautiful. And you know, growing up also, I think in the family we had like a lot of if you do something wrong, my dad would be like the Ofagunwa said in his book. <laughs> <That is quoted. laughs> so there were a lot of quotable quotes like flying around the house. Wow, so those are, those are really stuck in your head, all those quotes. Yeah, then I used to read a lot. So I was like every reader, if I, I was someone growing up that would pick up the newspaper, mm. I would read all sections. Even though, you know, they are in some, like in newspapers back home in Nigeria, there are some mm. boring sections that you just flip through. Yes. But I'm one that will read through all Everything. the sections, wow. read through the obituary sections. Like I will read every... <laughs> <laughs> I would read everything. Yeah, so I used to read a lot. Then I used to journal. I was interested in world affairs, what was going on around the world. Mm. So it, it used to be like my interest. I would journal the first president of this, the first woman to, you know, all of those things like used, used to catch my interest. I used to read like a lot of historical books. Mm. I was interested in Nigerian politics, the military coup. So, you know, I used to be like, then I used to be so introverted. So I was just like a very weird kid. So <laughs> then um, I couldn't dance growing up. I couldn't dance. So <laughs> neither I, I, can I. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the fact that I couldn't dance, you know, 
it just it was also so I just felt comfort with books. You know, I found mm-hmm. solace in literature, in, in books. I love the emotions. Then I then I think in junior secondary school I used to write screenplays. Oh. I used to write like act one, scene one. I used to do all of those like write like a full a full movie script. Wow. Like back then, so I think so. Growing up, everything has just been about you know writing, writing mm-hmm. language, and you know even you know. Even with spiritual words, you know, just mm. praying, everything is still bothered down on language. So language used to be like, you know, what, what we thrived on, yeah, mm. in the family reading. So I think it just came as a natural like metamorphosing from becoming a reader to becoming a, a writer. writer. But is this what you do full time, writing? No, um, I I work within the UK financial services sector. Oh, finance. Yeah, yeah, fintech and payment as a corporate compliance consultant wow. yeah so before then i used i worked for over a decade within financial crime compliance wow yeah. what's that like yeah so just ensuring that we have safer financial systems mm. ensuring that our financial systems are not used for you know for the process of money laundering oh. terrorist financing and wow. yeah just ensuring that we have like safer financial systems yeah. have you had any in- interesting encounters on that because it sounds very cool you know <laughs> <laughs> Any interesting stories about, you know, some big people you've guys caught money laundering or something like that? Yeah, I think the one that was fascinating was, I think it was back then around 2013, 14. Mm. And we had like some, it was a bit embarrassing though, but mm. we had like some Nigerian politicians used as case studies mm. for political exposed persons yeah. who, who used the UK system to launder funds. So I think that one wasn't too good on the Nigerian image and, you know, and being a Nigerian, seeing your people used as case studies here. So, yeah, so, but basically it's just to ensure that our customers are who they say they are. Mm. So when, you know, when we open bank accounts, they want to know your source of funds, your source of wealth, or, you know, your date of birth, your passport. So just mm. identification Very and verification, right. just to be sure that you're genuine and, mm. you know, your source of funds is legit. I am not involved in any money laundering or terrorist financing activities. Wow. Do you actually see any of that happening, like terrorist financing? Yeah, we, we see links, like we oh. see well, accounts that are closed. Yeah, so, you wow. know, there's the first level of defense, which is just at the, the first level. I am within second level of, the, of defense, mm. which is like compliance, monitoring, testing, and all of that. Then the third level of defense is audit. So within these three lines of defense, we ensure that, you know, there is a root block at each level to ensure that the system is not used, you know, for, you know, for proceeds of money laundering, terrorist financing. Mm. Then, you know, we do like screening as well. So as we are some, you know, when you open the bank account, mm. your name is screened against like databases, the sanctions database, you know, fraud and all of that. Special interest persons, there are people they call special des- designated nationals. What are those? Who are yeah, those? yeah, those are people that are like engage in like activities, you know, to promote it could be money laundry, could be terrorist financing. Mm. So all these things are stored in the database, and yeah, the links could be brought up at any time. So wow. it sounds honestly, it's quite cool. <laughs> so you can use, uh, can you use a bank account to track a terrorist then? Yeah. Because Have you done that before? It, yeah, because if the money true, so if the money goes through the banks, the banking system, then for every fund that comes to the, into the into the account, there's an audit true. Mm. Yeah, so that's that's why like every fund that comes into the account, we shouldn't like people that we don't know, don't let them send money into your account because you don't know who's being watched, yeah. who has whose account has been flagged. Mm. So we just really have to be careful the way like we transact. Don't let anyone pay money into your account. Anyone you don't know, you don't mm. know what they do. Even if the friend saying, "Oh, let me just pay <laughs> no, something." No, no, no. Or maybe you go to your shop, someone say, oh, "I have cash, take cash, let me pay into your account." And you know there are people that are like money moves that are used you know, all of that. Mm. And I think the most fascinating part for me was last year, I released a collection of financial crime compliance poems. So is this poems about financial crime? <laughs> I, it, Wait, give us one of those poems. I, I'm wondering what they will be sounding like. <laughs> I, uh, let me. I think the collection is somewhere here. So basically, it's uh, the financial crime compliance poetry. I I became like the first poet alive in the history of humankind to, to uh, like to write a full length collection of financial. The first human poet in recorded history to write a full-length collection of financial crime compliance poems. And I think I'll read one. Um, the, this one is, let me see, I think it's going to be interest rate, 45. 
And I'm sure a lot of people will... A poem re- about interest rates. Really? A poem <laughs> about interest rates. A lot of people will resonate with this. A lot of people are uh, already angry about it, interest yeah, rates. Yeah, <laughs> I know. So this was after the Bank of England increased interest rates mm-hmm. for the 11th consecutive time uh, by 0.25% to 4.25% on the 23rd of March 2023. The Bank of England dwells with inflation. Firecrackers. We are the remnants of the fireworks. The interest rate is a rising spring. Inflation is causing an uprising. The interest rate has grown tons, and we are green ons to this buffeting storm. The interest rate is on the rise. Inflation has swallowed sweet cravings, beating the brave, flattened fat wallet. Hmm. The, back, the Bank of England wrestles inflation and the casualties of these body blows are washed like sand mm. onto the seashore. So that was after the Bank of wow. England increased like interest rates. Wow. And yeah, so it was... So basically, um, the collection of financial crime compliance points looks at okay. everything regarding anti-money laundering, know your customer, sanctions. So the whole circle around financial crime compliance. Mm. And even if anyone who is out there is looking to get into like Financial crime, you know, a lot of people are looking to get into the industry as first timers. The book is a great resource, like for people to get that knowledge. You could just go to an interview, read this poetry collection. So I wanted, you know, to, I I love the fact that I'm able to like the, my knowledge over the years. Pass it I'm, on. Yeah, I'm able to pass yeah. it on. People can get the right, book yeah. and you know, just know every like the foundations of anti money laundering, KYC, and why we do customer due diligence as well. Wow. <laughs> Honestly, I never imagined poetry and finance in the same <laughs> sentence, but you've done it. <laughs> I've done it. I've done it. I've done it. <laughs> okay, so tell me about um your first book. Dead Lions Don't Roar. Yes, Dead Lions Don't Roar. So what inspired you to write that? And what's the meaning, Dead Lions Don't Roar? Yeah, inspirational poetry. I feel like... I had a lot going on in my life. Like what? I, I went I, I I went back to Nigeria in 2015. I jackpot back to Nigeria. Why did you jap <laughs> back to Nigeria? Nobody really jap back to Nigeria. So I got I got a job with a multinational oh. back home in Nigeria. And then my dad was you know, he was selling me the Nigerian dream. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh Nigeria is a land flow with milk and honey. You just have to come back home, you know, and all of that. So yeah, so I've always had like great admiration for Nigeria as well. I believe like Nigeria is, is us and it's a country that we could develop as well. So I went back to Nigeria in 2015. Then when things didn't really work out for me, I came back in 2016. Then I came mm. back fully fledged as a lion. I've been I've been writing for so many years. Mm. I've been you know while working at, at the Royal Bank of Scotland in Manchester, I used to be the resident writer for them. Wow. So I used to write like quotable wise words of the week, which was a regular future at the office back then. Mm. Yeah, so it was just like, you know, I've done this. I've been writing like personal development. You know, I, I write a lot of motivational articles. I've done like youth seminars back home in Nigeria. So I've been in that space of motivation. So mm. I feel like, oh, my first offering has to be something inspirational. And, you know, I, I know how life is, the fleeting nature. And while we are lions, we have to roll while we are here. So just do something different, something remarkable. Mm. And I felt I had to do that. Yeah, so that was how the idea of the Lions Don't Roll came about. Initially, I had one word title I was thinking about. But what was it? <laughs> <laughs> what would it have been called? <laughs> no, the Lions Don't Roll. I think it was something. I can't remember. I think it was Songs of Songs or something. Songs of Songs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like really... Songs of Solomon. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So it was, it was something. I can't remember, but it was something weird like that. Not so, as catchy I, as yeah, the Lions Yeah, so to my dad and the friend, and they were like, no, like, oh, the Lions. Because I think I had the poem already that I'd written like so many years. I think 2010, 2011. The mm. Lions Don't Roll. So they feel like can they, you tell us? Can you say the poem for us? That lion's don't. Open. Yeah, I need to just check the book. I'm growing old you now. You don't remember? <laughs> I'm growing. I'm growing very old right now. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, dead lions don't roll. Okay, I'll, I'll send that. Dead lions don't roll. As tranquil as the still waters, their legendary status now history. A history soon to be forgotten. In the graveyard lay many unsung heroes, six feet under the ground, therein abide great potentials, 
depriving the world of the benefit of their ideas. Mm. We suffer not for lack of talent. Many a talent bestrow the earth, mm. like buzzing bees besieging the honeycomb. The best of men have been laid to rest, mm. to rest with ideas confined within. The talented musician with no song to his name mm. was buried with his gift and talent in harmony. Use your gifts while you can, as dead lions don't roar. The memories of them mm. do fade away, do fade away with the errors. Uh, that's, that's quite <laughs> sad. It just makes me think of, you know, all the people whose talents they didn't get a chance to yeah. use it. And then, you know, like yeah. you mentioned, they're now six feet. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And I think um, the while, while I was working in the UK financial services sector, so I used to be really like big, big on the writing space. My blog was really doing, was doing really well. I was doing good numbers. So when I, I got in financial services in, in 2012, when I got into financial services, I felt like, oh, these people shouldn't know I'm a writer. Why? It was going to like, it could block my chances of progression. Oh. You know, the way you feel like, oh, if I do something else or I do something of my own, they, they, they wouldn't really like it. So I was kind of like hiding my gift, hiding my talent mm. until I went to like Royal Bank of Scotland and I started writing like in the office and everything. But eventually, I felt like, no, I have to do this. And that's why I have titles like The Lions Don't Roll. Unravel your eating gems because at a point all my gems were like eating as well. I mm. didn't, I, I could not showcase it because I was afraid. But now my writing and my career they go hand in hand as well. My my work within corporate compliance, I, I write a lot of reports, I do a lot of research. So so at the end of the day, we could always find ways to like where all these careers and our private endeavors where where they intersect. Mm. So yeah, so that was how the Lions Oro came about, inspirational poetry. Mm -hmm. And that also led to, you know, the the follow up in the sequel, Dead Dogs Don't Bark and They Don't Bite and Dead Cats Don't Meow. And at that <laughs> point in time I was like going crazy with all the dead <laughs> the dead teams. From the lions were, to the they, dogs to the I, I thought I thought my first one would be like dead tigers don't growl and people would be giving me oh, you know. Oh, funny ideas, dead men don't talk, you mm. know, dead fish don't swim, you know, a lot of, but at a point I felt, okay, it's enough to do, you know. <laughs> you've gone through all the dead things. <laughs> you've gone through, you've gone through a lot of, you know, dead, dead stuff. <laughs> Let's move back to reality. So what actually happened in Nigeria when you went back? That, yeah, mm. yeah I, I felt like the, I couldn't fit in like that. Mm. How? What, yeah, what yeah. was the, you know, what place were you in? What went, what went on? Yeah, so it was okay. It was a multinational, you know, international dimension and everything. It was really good. But after a while, I spent about three or four months in Lagos. I was posted to Asaba. And, you know, like from the UK, you know, <laughs> moving to Asaba. <laughs> it wasn't the best. It was shocked. <laughs> <laughs> it was a big shock. <laughs> I remember one day on the Kakena Pep, I was like, oh, with this fake accent. And the guy, the Apple driver was like, go back to where you. <laughs> Go back to where you came from. Go back to where you came from. Like, wow. yeah. It was just like, if you're frustrated, there, yeah, just go back. Yeah, but... Huh. But yeah, Nigeria was a bit like... It wasn't it wasn't easy. And you know, like in the UK, I remember one one day, I, was, I went to the cinema with my with my wife and I had like 32 missed calls on my phone, even like on a Sunday. Hmm. So, you know, Nigeria doesn't give you that liberty whereby you could have your own free time, your personal time. Then the buses as well is either their way... <laughs> or nobody's way. So I just feel at some point like, oh, I've had enough. I have to I have to come back. I still have my uh, UK resident permit. <laughs> <laughs> Let me dust you off and, you know, make the trip back to the UK. How did your dad feel about that? Yeah, you decided to come back? Yeah, it was beginning of the, it was the beginning of the Buari era. So, <laughs> so things were not like, then there was a lot of, then there was, kidnapping was not that much back, mm. back in the days, but, you know, whenever I travel from Lagos or somebody, there used to be the, there was a lot of tension. Oh, are you at your destination yet? You know, mm. my car, if my car breaks down the road in the middle of nowhere, wow. know, the risk was just, it was just too much. Yeah. So I felt like, oh, let me just come back before. So, but I, I think everything was just divinely orchestrated in terms of coming back. In what yeah. way? Yeah. Because now 22 books. So oh. at times, at times you feel like, oh, going back to Nigeria, well, you know, what what could have happened? What could have, even though I was writing like on the on the very big stage back then, mm. and by the time I came back, 
I just, you know, I had to unravel my own eating gems as well. I felt like, yeah, over the years, I've been writing a lot. And even Unravel Your Eating Gems, the collection of inspirational and motivational essays was a culmination of all my writings, even before Dead Lions. Mm. Dead Lions, although there were some poems that were like 20, 10, 20 in the early years. Mm. Unravel Your Eating Gems has spanned over, like, over that period as well. Yeah, so mm. because I've been... I've been writing, so I lost some of my writings when yeah. yeah when my website broke down at some point. Wow! But, How did you feel yeah, well, having was, your website break down? Yeah, what, what, what was it like? It was it was sad. <laughs> I felt I felt I felt I felt sad, but we were able to retrieve like a lot a lot a lot of what what I had written at that time. But I used to like even back in the days as far back as 2010, my website used to be like on Linda Kiji's blog. When Linda Kiji used to like ask us because we had like small community, Linda was like into entertainment. I was into like personal development. We had other guys who were like into tech and all of all of that. Mm-hmm. So Linda used to ask for free ads then, just to, you know, just to occupy, <laughs> <laughs> just you know, as a startup as well. You want people to patronize you. You don't. You can't charge them, mm-hmm. but just for people. So my my website used to be on our blog. So I've been in the game, but 2017. You know, moved down. I moved to Newcastle in 2016. Mm. But Newcastle has been that place. It's been home for me. Mm. Like you know, you move to some places, you develop an affinity for that city, and in that way, I feel like, I, I in my poem in Dead Dog Stone Back, Newcastle, the city of my shining star. I said, if Newcastle was a damn cell, will you say I do? That means I'm like, if Newcastle was a babe, I would just pick her <laughs> off and say, come on, let's let. Will you say I do? I'm, wow. ready, I'm ready to commit my life to you. Yeah. So. So what was the transition like? You know, you already, you know, building yourself up, you know, in Nigeria as a writer, all of that, and then moving to Newcastle. What was the change like for you? How did you fit in? How did you um, get used to it? Yeah. So it, the the movement initially was from. So I, I was in the UK originally, 2010 okay. to 2015. Anyways, I used to write as well, but just like low key, all of that. Mm. Then moving to moving back in 2016, I moved mm. to Manchester. Then I go I got a job in Newcastle. Then yeah, so moved down to Newcastle. It was it was okay. I in, integrated myself into the community in those intimate spaces mm. where you know poets, writers you know, where they where they meet. And I, I think I even had like a very a life changing experience as well. What happened? So at at that point I was like with a community of writers trying to, you know, mingle with them. So at that point I was looking for an endorsement with the Art Council England. So there was this there was a writer then who, you know, based in Northern Poet as well, based in, you know, based in, in the Northeast. So it was, it was, it sent me, I see, I see check, I see check his email like from time to time. So I said, oh, can I get like a draft letter of support to the Arts Council in England? So he said, okay, he sent me something. He sent me, he sent me a letter. Mm. So, but I think about a few weeks after the, the guy, he had butchered someone to death. Yeah. They, he had butchered a lady who was disabled in the Northeast, is, is in jail now. He butchered someone to death and that could have been me. That could have been me like going to his house to say, or oh, because I actually went to a, 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 a friend of mine who happens to be a poet. I went to his house and they noticed. But that could have been me going to a stranger's house. Yeah, so a stranger's house I met on the on the circuit to get a letter, not knowing that this guy <laughs> not doing, you know, like not knowing like the art of man. And he was so friendly to me, was so kind, but I think couple of you know weeks or months down the line mm. i just saw that they shared the news to us in the community they had he had been jailed in one of the hmp pre, one of the prisons mm. and yeah it was just that was like it was crazy because i felt like this could have been me it what did that have... teach you about meeting up with strangers <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was a life-changing experience just you know just be just be careful. You never know what you, you don't know is a cycle. <laughs> who could like who could have like demonic intentions and everything. Mm. Yeah. So but I think apart from that sour point, I mean like I've met like a lot of amazing people in Newcastle. Mm. I've been to places to perform where so they'll be shouting, I will pay, I will pay to have you. Like people are saying, I will pay to watch you perform. Like mm. a few weeks ago, I I had a documentary. 
do, I, I was featured on a documentary film mm-hmm. because of my literary achievements as well. Mm-hmm. So Newcastle has been this the support has been really you know. And the first time I performed in Newcastle initially, that was in I think 2016, 17. Mm-hmm. I you know I just went to I went on stage. Mm-hmm. And the lady was like, oh, there was a, this northern poet. I said, well, can I perform on the open mic? He said, no, it's full. Mm. You can't come on. I said, please, please, can I come on stage? And she permitted me. And she was she was saying the story herself, like last year, that she's watched me become one of the most prolific writers in the whole of the northeast of England. So it goes to show that when you give people a chance, when you give them opportunities to thrive, mm. the world is is their oyster. So Newcastle has been remarkable for me. Oh, it's been know. a beautiful place. I've you know I've you know to become there. There are some writers that when I got into Newcastle, I used to like look up to. Now they now look up to me. Oh, I've wow. moved from you know if a, a poet friend said when you came you were a little cub. Oh. Now I look <laughs> up to you. Wow. Yeah. So that's it goes. Great. It goes to show that. We can achieve anything if you put our heart to it as well. So would you say that um, the reason you've gotten so much success in your career is because you got the right opportunities? The right opportunities came knocking? Mm, I wouldn't say it was because it came knocking because I, I would say it was because I was prepared. Hmm. I was alive. I was ready in the place of preparation. I remember a director we won consultancy for my work to it and she was like, the way to look at, you know, the way to look at knocking and looking for opportunities. And yeah, even though it wasn't like it was coming on the platter of code, mm-hmm. but I was ready. I did my, 2016, I did my, I think as of 2013, I, I was just, you know, the courses, business analysis, foundation, chain management, IT, just brings to, you know, I was just like, I was a man on a mission. Mm. 2016, combating financial crime. By 2017, I had my ACAM certification. Uh, I became a certified anti-money laundry specialist. So I was just like in the place of preparation. I knew what I wanted to become. I think my initial goal, dream was to become the central bank governor in Nigeria. Wow. Yeah, because I, I studied economics mm. at the university. And when we went to the central bank of Nigeria's office, then Charles Ludo was a CBN governor. So, and that was where I sat down on a chair and people were calling me Tolu, Toludo. That mm. was how my name, Tolu Toludo, came about. Wow. Yeah, so people were, like my cosmates then thought like, oh, this guy will be the next central, central bank. bank governor. Yeah. So, so Ludo was the governor. That was an inspiration. Then I became like an imitation of Toludo, Toludo as a student. <laughs> Yeah, so, but I think what's really worked was it's not just about waiting for the right opportunities to come. Mm. It was just about, like, getting myself prepared. Even when I'm coming to you to say, oh, I am ready. I have things to show. Mm. If I'm telling you, oh, can I perform at your event? I have success stories. I have books to show. If I'm saying, can I get this career opportunity? Mm. Because in the place of preparation, I'm ready. Mm. So I'm, I'm putting myself forward for these opportunities as well. So... I think it's very important for people in our community as well to not to believe that you cannot do it. When I say within corporate compliance now, I see I don't see a lot of black people. And my 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 goal now is to get more people within that second line of defense. Because like you would imagine we have a lot of Nigerians in the first like even there's no financial project, mm. anti-money laundering project in this United Kingdom that you see today, fully dominated by Nigerians. Hmm. Nigerians make the Nigerians and possibly people of Asian origin as well, your majority Nigerians. So we have this ability to like, we are, we are high flyers, we are making a lot of progress, but it's just left for our people now to be able to get into, you know, second line of defense, the third line of defense, because that way we can get to the top. So, and I think that's part of my goal as well, to see how I can help like people within my community, you know, what can you do? And when I see jobs, opportunities, you know, you just send to people, this is what you can apply to. This is, you know, this is what, this is this opportunity come along, mm. benefit from it. So I think it's very important for us to be alive in the place of preparation, not just waiting yeah. for opportunities to come. I like the fact that you didn't just, you know, sit down waiting for good opportunities to come, but you were chasing yeah, yeah. and actively, going out there. Actively chasing, yeah. So because even while like at the consultancy firm, I kept, there were some directors I kept like, and you know, I'm talking about relationships as well, we, we need like to have like good interpersonal relationships. Mm. We, like I said, relationships is a current that controls our life. Yeah. So I'm always, I'm, I'm someone that builds like good relationships with people. 
mm. you know, with corporate leaders. Everyone just like, they are drawn to me, they like me. So don't just come with a cowboy approach in the workplace and be behaving, you know. We just need to show like good values. And also as a writer as well, I think I have that, I carry that responsibility as well mm. because you are telling people, oh, developing excellence as a workplace culture. Are you excellent in your own work? Mm. You can't say, some people will say, oh, why are you doing, why are you eating your targets? But if you want to, if you want to show that you're excellent, you have to do your work. Yeah. So, if you're if you are telling people that developing excellence as a workplace culture, building the right value system, then you have to be able to show people as well. You have to walk that talk. You have to yeah. show that, yeah. Because, you because if they, if, so at, at that point, I feel like, oh, I was bigger than where I was, but, I still had to I had to prove myself to mm. get to where I wanted to be. Wow. Yeah, so I think it's very important for us as a people, as a community as well, to have the right value system, to do the right things. Yeah. When you're in when you're in the workplace, be excellent. It's that excellence that can get you to the top. Yeah. Mm. So tell me about the process of unlocking your hidden gems. Yeah, unlocking your hidden gems, first of all, you need to know, you need to know within you that you know, you are more than where you are. You can mm. do much more better. Your voice deserves to be heard. Mm. So every we all have gifts. We all have talent. Mm. Do you want to, you, you, you know, you, you don't want to die with your gifts and talents like the poem, you know, the Lion Stone Row made allusion to. So we all know, we all know all of these things. We all know we are talented people. We can do mm. much more than where we are. So don't let your skin color be a barrier. Mm. The fact that you're in the UK doesn't mean you cannot bring your dreams to life. There are so many of us, we have books, we have experiences that we need to document as well. Because the thing is that if we don't tell our stories, mm. or it, it could be distorted. Yes, somebody yeah. else can tell it the yeah. wrong way. Yeah, the wrong way. Mm. I remember going to the market, you know, the time out market, selling my books and my collection of COVID poems. Mm. Someone walked up to me and said, Tolu, thank you so much for writing this book. Because what we get is that in years to come, people might just come up with different lies around, Everyone. you know, the COVID times. Yeah. So it's always very important for us to tell our stories. Telling our stories also comes with a lot of vulnerability. But at the end of the day, your be, you're being vulnerable will help others as well. Mm. So being vulnerable is not a bad thing. It also helps others dealing with that same situation as well. Did you always know that you'd be an award-winning poet? I, I I always knew I was made for more. Mm. I come from a great lineage of great people. My my partner grandfather, Donald Leeds, he was a leader of a musical band, wow. and he was a great storyteller in his time. So my maternal grandmother as well, she was a great storyteller. She would regale me with stories about her life, about things that happened in her community at the time. So, you know, just, you know, listening to stories. So I knew I was made for more. I knew mm. there was something within, there was greatness within. And I knew it was just for me to unravel my own hidden gems. We all have roles. We all have talent. We all can do amazing things with our talent. Mm. It's just for us to come to that place of acceptance. And to be fair, a lot of people, it, it's just, you know, just starting. People have dreams, but they don't know how to start. Will I feel what? But I think the only, the only thing you can do to yourself is just to start. You start with what you have. Start anyhow. Mm. Those are some of the things I've written about in the past. I have healthy relationships because relationships are the current that controls our lives. So can you dig deep uh, into that? Have healthy relationships. What do you mean by that? Can you explain it a bit more? Yeah, having healthy relationship means like, you know, you know, relationships within boundaries, within, you know, just cultivate good relationships because what at times it's not all about money. You don't need to have money to achieve your goals, just people. I wrote a poem about, you know, people being the currency that you need to navigate through the rough edges that life may throw your way. Mm. You might be poor in cash. You might be you, you might be poor in cash but rich in people. So if you are poor in cash, but you are rich in people, just know that everything you are looking to achieve, mm. you know, will, will, will come to fruition. So just ensure the relationships are healthy, mm. not people, because some people take advantage of relationships as well. Parasitic relationships, looking to take away, take from you, but not willing to sow anything to, into that relationship. So I believe like cultivating healthy relationships is one of the conduit pipes I've seen 
within my own family as well. Mm-hmm. I've seen the benefit of having like LD beneficial relationships, seeing how uh, my father, you know, after he left, he left teaching. He, wo- he, he worked briefly in banking before before he went into the Nigerian capital market. And he had a stellar career span over 30 years. And I could see like the beauty of relationships, relationships he cultivated over the years. And that, that goes to show that relationships. So that's like a currency about people that, you know, who, who because they know me, they came across me, they're in the United Kingdom today. Mm-hmm. So because it's all about relationships, mm-hmm. what, how can you benefit your community, your people? It's very important. So those elder relationships, those people that, you know, don't have people in your circle that you just want to be the chairman among people that... <laughs> <laughs> You know, some people just want to be like the shining light among people that are not doing well. Mm. But they can hand out 50k, 20k. But so they can look down on them and yeah, feel important. Yeah, feel important, <laughs> yeah. But for me, I feel like I'd we empower people as well. Mm. So being able to like, oh, this these people within my community that God has brought into my life, I, I can I add value to them as well. Mm-hmm. So I think in that way, we need, to, we need to also know the boundaries as well. Where someone has overstepped the mark, because at times people also take advantage of your kindness as well. Yes. Yeah, they take that's very of, true. Yeah, they take advantage of your kindness. So mm-hmm. even when you've invested into them, invested into their lives, into their mm-hmm. activities, they is now reciprocal. Mm-hmm. So that's why the LD has to be part of it as well. LD relationships, when you see it's no longer beneficial, or people are just only after their own interest, then you see, you know, you can and it's not it's not requiring to cut off like from Toxic people, yes. Toxic relationships as well. Mm, that's true. It's not a crime because yeah. <laughs> it can really ruin your yeah. life. Yeah, you can. You can. So you've got obviously twenty two books. Yeah. So what makes a good book? Because many people, you know, are into writing, but they don't know if their book is good or not. What makes a good book? Yeah. Well, um, if I if I break it down into, you know, p- um, let me first of all look at poetry. Mm. For for poetry, in my own estimation. Mm. I would say a poem, you know, I love poems that make me think, that make me feel, Mm. that, you know, transports me. And even for fiction as well, I love, you know, writing that transports me into another world. Mm. So while, like, I was in Nigeria growing up, I used to read a lot of books. We had this, like, this reading group, friends, teenagers, we used to exchange books. I loved, even though I was living in Nigeria back then, I could just imagine myself being abroad, you know, because that's the power of books. Mm. You could you could be in the trenches. And picture but, it all. Yeah, you can just imagine yourself living the life in Banana Island. <laughs> 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 or, or having breakfast with the, queen, with, the, with the king or queen of England, you know. <laughs> so that's the beauty. Yeah, so for me, I feel like books that, you know, make me, and for me as well, my writings, you know, they, they transport the reader, they, you know, they make them feel that emotion, make them to think. Mm. And I think, yeah, and a good book as well has to be properly edited as well. Mm. Yeah, so properly edited as a purpose, as a message. Why are you trying to, you know, like my collection of short stories, in Final of Silence, I asked stories like Black Lives Matter and also the story, in Final of Silence, men who are in toxic relationships mm. you know these are this this are some of the issues that affect people in our community as well mm. so what message what message can you get f- from you know from reading that story how to know the limits when you're in a toxic relationship mm. so yeah so a good book and i think for me as well you know writing the book I've been in the market so many times selling my books myself and i feel the pulse of the reader if you sell a good book and you're in the marketplace, yeah, fair enough. But you can't actually go to the market week in, week out because mm. customer feedback is coming as well. So you always have to like try your best. But also a lot some writers will say, oh, there's no original writing, but I beg to differ as well. Mm. I believe that there is, there's still, lit, you, you could still do something, you can, you know, you could do something valuable, something original, original at all, yeah. something new. Mm. Don't think, oh, everything has been written. You are recycling metaphors from other writers or you are looking into other people's books before you could get your inspiration or you are mm. plagiarizing other, other people's work. Mm. I believe that there could still be that originality in voice. So I've, I've written poems that people would be like, oh, this is raining metaphors. Like, <laughs> yeah, because I take my time to, you know, to imagine why men are sleeping 
I'm writing mm. in the in, in the in, in the dawn of the morning, running, jogging, exercising, I'm colliding with nature, communing with the spirits. Mm. There was a time I I also read a collection of poems, a God in the human body. Mm. And I believe we are all gods, we are all powerful people, we speak words, you know. Like now we talk about twenty two books, but this were at some point, if I didn't take that action to write those books, nobody, you know, nobody will even know the name Tolu Yakimi today. Mm. Or if they know me, they just know me maybe for my work within my financial services career or my just blog writing of blogs. Mm, but, but not about your passion. Yeah, not about my passion. And I think when I started out, I think the key ingredient for me was passion like you mentioned now yeah. you have to be passionate anything you lay your hands on you have to be passionate about it so like i, I didn't have access in terms of to the gatekeepers within the community people mm. would, like put me on mm. I, w- I was passionate you know i had that drive i'm the one who will go on stage with, and even you know people were coming to meet me white people like oh we love your confidence like wow. a, a black man goes on stage and white people are coming to greet him that so I have I have to pause you here because there are four things you've said okay. that I need to touch on Okay, so I don't forget them. Okay, okay. the first thing you said first you said you're communing with spirits what spirits are you communing with <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you can just explain that <laughs> you said you commune with spirits what spirits do you commune with yeah so <laughs> communing with spirits uh, you know being being a writer you 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 pay attention as well there are times I've I've slept at night and I woke up and I started writing. Mm. So you know that life is also very, very spiritual in nature as well. So communion with spirits just means that I'm saying that we also we are spiritual beings. Not that you're talking to different spirits. No, no. So no. If you are, you can explain. No, no. <laughs> and, the, <laughs> and the second thing you said, which really um I really loved, was about originality. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. Many people like for me, as someone who makes films, yeah, you know, when I see, oh, they do this film, part one, part yeah. two, third version, fourth yeah. version, yeah. it's like there's no originality anymore. People yeah. are just doing the same movie yeah. over and over again. Yeah. And for me, it troubles me because it's like, aren't there any other stories to tell? Yeah. So that's why me, myself, I like, you know, trying to tell my own story through yeah. a film. Yeah. Because like you said, if you don't tell your own story, someone yeah. else would tell it yeah. and rewrite it the way yeah. <laughs> the way they want it done. Yeah. So yeah, originality is important. Yeah. So yes, people should dig deep, find original stories yeah. to put out there. Yeah. And then the third thing you mentioned was about your book, Inferno. Oh, sorry, oh, sorry. Sorry. Yes, please, please. <laughs> Can you dive into that a bit m- more? Yeah, so Inferno Silence was about, you know, the story talks about a, a man who is in a relationship with a you know a woman during the courtship stage mm. you know everything was 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 rosy was sweet you know those kind of social media love <laughs> <laughs> love wanted <laughs> <laughs> love wanted picture perfect love mm. <laughs> everything is sweet you know but until he went into the marriage mm. and he saw that it was it wasn't the way he envisaged it to be Mm. And yeah, so and there are a lot of men who are in those sort of relationships, toxic relationships, mm. abusive relationships, mm. and they don't have a, they don't know how to get out of those relationships. That's interesting because in this, what you're talking about, is basically the female that's being abusive. Yeah, because yeah. many times you talk about toxic relationships, yeah. it's always the men they have in mind. Yeah, mm. yeah. So, so I wrote that book. That book came out in 2020 during during COVID times. Mm. Yeah, so a lot of men face those sort of issues. And I think being in the diaspora as well, if you are in, if you are facing abuse in the diaspora, it's not as easy as like maybe being in Africa. Why? Yeah, because you know it's it's more it's more expensive to to survive. Say, let let me use the UK as an example. Mm. So if you are, at times people just stay in there because they have nowhere to go, you do, then possibly you don't want to leave your family separate from your kids. And all of that. Mm. So to start to start a game, maybe to get a different house, is not cheap. So I think mm. a lot of people, you know, in you know, in the diaspora, is is much more challenging for them. But because, and I think I've also like seen people go through those sort of situations and scenarios as well, mm. whereby you know, and it's not. So I try to like put that down in a story, to you know, to document the issues that men face when it comes to like toxic relationships, abuse, and you know, the way that story ended, how uh, 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 you, uh, you can get out of it as well. Mm. Wow. 
Oh. Wow, so touching. <laughs> no, it's true. A lot of men do go through yeah, abuse. Yeah, yeah, a lot. Like I have a friend who, you know, was married and was going through a lot of abuse. Yeah. And it was so difficult for him to try and get out because of his kids yeah, and everything. Yeah. And nobody will really <laughs> believe you as a yeah, man. Yeah. Because they're more yeah. likely to believe, you know, yeah. a woman. And I think, yeah, uh, the book cover shows a man with muffled hands covering his mouth. Real men do cr- don't cry. Mm. Men cannot be raped. You are lying. Children are women first. So, well, you know, it shows that men, you know, men's rights are like relegated into the background most times. Mm. Men cannot, you know, and for, and I think the issue with men is that you, you'll be seen as being weak if you talk about your issues, about your relationships and about your challenges as well. Mm. And I think leading on from that, I wrote a collection of poems titled Never Marry a Writer. <laughs> So what inspired that? <laughs> yeah, so for me, I feel like it, um, when I, when we talk about documenting our stories and all of that, writers are powerful people. Write, writers, we could use our writings to like shape society, shape culture, yeah. shape the way people think. Mm-hmm. So I believe that if you are abusive, either as a man or, or a woman, don't go near a writer. <laughs> because you'll be the muse. I say if you... If you give a writer joy, they will, they will make you a hero. Mm. If you give them grief, you will be you will be a villain. You will be the villain in the story. Mm. They'll write about you. Yeah, yeah. So have so, you ever done that? Written about somebody? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, definitely. Because like my writing and, and couple, and, you know covers the whole spectrum of the human experience. Mm. So obviously, human experience we get ideas from everywhere, from relationships, issues that affect us. I've written poems around grief and sadness, hmm. you know, so... Have you experienced grief? Yeah, I've experienced, I've, you know, I've I've lost people that are, that are close to me, that are dear to me, hmm. and yeah, so... Yeah, so we, we write about all of these experiences, issues that affect us. I've written the collection of poems titled Black Does Not Equal Inferior. Yes, I wanted to get into that. So um, you seem to do a lot of writing about race, about black race. Yeah. Um, Why? What's your reason behind it? Yeah, because we need to empower our people as well. We need to let our people know that they are more than who they think they are or what the outside world wants them to believe they are. Mm. So when I wrote Black Does Not Equal Inferior, it was after the killing of George Floyd Jr. And I felt like I needed to like write a collection of poems that speaks to the black experience, mm. a mantra for the black community, that being black does not equal being inferior. And, you know, then I was working within financial crime compliance, working, you know, I, I could be in the meeting room with senior stakeholders, with the governance teams, and I'll be one of two or three black people in the room. Mm. And I felt that was not, that was not good enough. And at, at some point I was feeling as if I was an imposter. I wasn't, wow. I wasn't supposed to be there because the fact that you're, you're in such a big room and you feel like, oh, what? What if I say something? Would it be accepted? Would it, you know? So, well, the fact that one is black does not mean you are not, you know, does not mean you are not good enough or does not mean you can't be the best version of yourselves. Mm. Being black does not, should not signal to you that it's not the end of the world. And yeah, so it was just a book written to, you know, to tell our community that being black, you know, people of the black experience, that you can achieve phenomenal things. There was this, um, I think it was in 2021, Green Park Consultancy is a UK consultancy firm. They did a research around, you know, the FTSE, those are the companies, the top 100 companies listed on the London Stock Exchange, the mm. FTSE 100, and there were no, there was no black person on as a chair, as a CEO or CFO of all the top 100 companies in the UK. Mm. So I think the issue then was that I couldn't see, I, I wrote an article about, oh, you know, there are not enough black corporate leaders within the within the corporate environment as well. There was no one that you could look up to say, I want to aspire to become like. Mm-hmm. So that was a big issue as well. So why would you say, uh, why do you think there are no black um, corporate leaders? Is it because we're not good enough or we're not working hard enough for those positions? Mm-hmm. Uh, not 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 so not not so much, and that and that wouldn't be the reason. Mm. I think um, we have within our community the young people coming up, 
I think some of our priorities are different as well. Mm. People want to make money for today. <laughs> so the attrition rate is quite high among the black community. Mm. People get into work today. They leave. They are not thinking about the future. People just want like immediate gratification. So that could be one of the reasons. But also when we talk about diversity in the workplace, equal opportunity in the workplace, it's not always the way it's being painted. How? Yeah, so... Basically, there are times they will say, oh, this we are an equal opportunity employer. But most times you see like the opportunities, like working within financial services, a lot of like black people are stacked. Master's degree, mm. bachelor's degree, some two master's degree, MBA, mm. some MBA and master's degree. But they don't get a chance. And you see someone who's not been to school is a team leader. So uh, you tell me you're an equal opportunity employer, even by the way you, you know, you share the rules, the way, you know, you, you tell people to submit CV for an interview, but you already know who your preferred candidate is. So there are a lot of issues that, you know, when, when you talk about diversity, at times it's just me, you know, it could be to play to the gallery. So, mm. so it's been like, it's been like a big issue where as a black boy growing up, you look within the corporate organization structure who, who can I aspire to be like? Like at times, even within like where I was second like line of defense, I, d- I don't see enough black people. And I'm like, oh, our people are like in the fire, fire in the first line of defense, working the cases, get doing the analyst work, the QC work, the QA work. Mm. But how, how do our people get into second line of defense? How do they get into audits? Because from there, we can aspire to the top, to get to the top positions. Wow. So I think it has to be like systematic, strategic as well within our community. We need to change our focus and our priorities as well. For you to get like to the very top, you need to also start thinking about building a career. Then we also need it. We also have to also think within the community, how do we create sustainable wealth as well? Mm. Yeah. So and I think the existing having like people, if, if, you're, if you're working, can you put some money aside towards retirement? have insurance policies, you know, just have different things because when we talk about emancip- emancipating our people <laughs> for the truth of poverty, you don't want to see people, people, people who are dying that are doing GoFundMe. That's not <laughs> the way. Mm. That shouldn't be the way. Mm. Have insurance policies, have critical illness cover, have all of these things. It's yeah. very important. We need to educate our people as well mm. that this, and they don't cost much. 20 pounds you go to for 20 pounds to go to watch a film or just have a good time out there so committing 20 pounds or 100 pounds monthly for your insurance policies just to ensure because that's way some families like even some the other ethnic groups that's the way they make sustainable wealth as well Mm -hmm. when someone passes millions of pounds or close to a million pounds is released to the family people have money to pay off the mortgage you don't want someone just to bury a family member you're asking for go fund me hmm. that isn't good enough sure. so so our community we have to actually like we have to do better as well do better yeah have to do better so have you ever experienced um racism or anything in your you know in your line of work uh, in my line of work uh, i've you have two lines of work so <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Let's start with the um let's start with the um within the writing community. No, within the writing community, I would say I would say not really. Mm. Because um well maybe because I have a prominent voice, um I'm well known. But yeah, I think the only thing I do that happens is that I have to like strive for opportunities myself. Mm. I don't wait for people to platform me or give me opportunities. I'm always looking out for, you know, the right opportunities to, you know, to get my work out there. I, I like to build, build mm. platforms because I think most, the mistake most people make is that we are waiting for people to like showcase our work, give us the opportunity. Help but at times, <laughs> but at times you have to like help yourself as well. Mm. Is it on your WhatsApp story? Is it on your Instagram page? What what can you do? What can you put out there? Mm. Can you have a website where you can also platform all that? So, mm. so I would say not 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 really. Although at times I I, I sense that I might be overlooked for opportunities I deserve, but mm. I wouldn't say that that's a big issue for me. I don't have to beg anyone to, you know, to give me that platform. You push for it yourself. Yeah, yeah. I push, I push for it myself. Wow. And I think, in, I think, I think very recently I was, we're doing like a renovation work in the house mm. and I, you know, got two white British people to work for me, a painter 
and the plumber and they were like taking the piece like the plumber go like close to 1600 pounds he did rubber like fake items didn't complete the job he stole items from the boiler that you know that was in the property and he was trying you know he stole the items then he said he wanted to be paid before finishing the work then the painter too, you know, and now he's saying, oh, I want my balance. Well, you've not done the proper job. Yeah. So I, I told I, I told them, I said, this is despicable. This is this mm-hmm. is very terrible behavior. Mm-hmm. So we still have people like that who are in the society who do not understand that. I said, I know you will not do this to a white person. Mm-hmm. I, I had to be honest. I had to be brutally honest. Yeah, so, but I think within financial services in the past, I had a boss who kept on a, a, an operations you know, manager kept arguing me, telling me, you don't deserve to be here because... Someone told you you don't deserve to yeah, be here. Yeah, you don't deserve to be here because uh, you are. You should be You should be foco- focused on your writing. You are, you are not supposed to be here. And I was like... And the person was just trying to orchestrate. They, they, they even orchestrated my exit, but that led to a bigger promotion for me. I, <laughs> I, was, I was transferred to London, paid wow. five stars hotels, paid <laughs> all my travel paid, my feeling paid. So, I did, but they were like plotting something bad for me if they see me anything you say told you you stood up on your desk for 10 minutes I, what's going on this there are people in this office that go and smoke every two, two minutes so why uh, why the attack on you so but and you know and these same people when they see you on linkedin sharing success stories they are the first to congratulate you but in the office <laughs> they, they, just, they just ghost you and you know being you know aggression and all of that so it was just so we face a lot of these issues mm. you know in the community i've um i've had you know when my daughter was i think I, I wrote a poem about it when she was around three years old where she was told in the class that her hair her hair stinks and she shouldn't be using that you know she shouldn't be using that hair cream like the, the whatever you are putting on her hair you know Someone told your daughter yeah, the, yeah, 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 the, yeah, the teacher brought it to our what, attention. What that, race was the... They, they, they were white, you know, right? So they brought it to our attention that, oh, the air is, you know, the, the air cream, they don't want it in, in the class because the air, yeah, so... How did you feel hearing that? Yeah, I felt... And someone say that about yeah, just, your just, just, just wrote a poem about it. That was where I could You didn't my... go over to find the person. No. You just expressed your anger in a yeah. poem. <laughs> yeah, using use artistry to, you know... To, wow. to, to paint that picture. Yeah, so there are, there are issues, mm-hmm. there are things that we face and all of that. Well, how did you build your daughter's confidence up from that? Because mm-hmm. hearing that kind of thing might have affected her. I guess what did you do? I guess because she was very young at that time, so she didn't really, you know, and even now I'm sure she w- she wouldn't remember, but she wouldn't remember the episode again. But mm-hmm. yeah, it was, it was it wasn't really good. Like, I've had to like, you know, make some decisions based on, you know, aggression, bias, discrimination, if it if I feel like if you are addressing like young people as well, you are you are a teacher of young people or you are teaching young people, there should be a way you should treat those young people. Yeah. But we don't respond to young people the way you respond to an adult. They can't at times young people just do stuff, they don't even think about it. So you if you are now aggressive to them or to a young person, then I would I would be sensing, Oh, is it because they are black or you, you get where I'm coming from? Mm. So oh, wow. So, but I think it's a message we need to keep on echoing that being black doesn't make you inferior. Yeah. And as and I think in our community as well, we need we need more father figures, more role models as well mm. within the community. When when that um colleague said those words to you, you don't deserve to be here. You know, how did you battle that? Because some for some people, those words would stick in their head. They'd be thinking, oh, I don't deserve to be here. I don't deserve to be here. What did you do to you know? Make sure those words didn't stick in your subconscious. Mm, because uh, this is the Lion of Newcastle. <laughs> <laughs> you wrote that in the. <laughs> no, it wasn't really a lady. Yes, it was a lady. So the Lion of Newcastle. What cannot you know? What cannot bring me down? Mm. I'm, I'm an optimist, and you know I don't give I don't give attention to things like that. Mm. Yeah. So, but I know that you know been even i've been to I've, I've worked in places in terms where they said oh we didn't know you were this prominent because i'm not really about i'm not really about showcasing oh i'm this i'm that i say oh you're on wikipedia you're on this you're on that no, it's not about <laughs> that i'm just here to do my work so even in my current workplace it was just only recently they found out like oh some of the leaders found out that oh i'm a i'm a writer a, a successful writer mm. so it's not just, i'm just there just, just do my job I'm not, I don't want to become a resident poet or 
But while whilst working with a big consultancy firm so many years ago, I was like a, I was a resident poet, mm. and yeah. So, but I think also what what that does for you is that at times you might get lost in mm. that fanfare of being an internal poet or to an organization, forgetting that the whole world is your community. Yes. The whole world is your oyster. Mm. So then I was writing some poems that I mean, I was like, oh no, why did you write this? <laughs> because I was just getting lost in that euphoria of that small community. Mm. And that's like make a decision to say, do I want to be a poet for a corporate organization or do I want to be a poet that they all want to reckon with? Mm, and at wow. that point, there was a shift. There was a big shift for me as well. Earlier on, you mentioned um, you didn't have a gatekeeper. So um, how did you, what did you do? You know, not, okay, for many things. Yeah. If you want to put your movies on certain platforms, yeah. if you want, you know, your work to get to certain places, you need to know somebody to get in there. So what did you do for people out there who might be watching who might not have a gatekeeper, you know, might not have those connections? What can they do to push their work out there? Yeah, so for me as a writer, you know, some writers believe that, oh, you need to get into some certain magazines for you to become an elite writer. But as a writer as you know you need to know you need to know your own identity mm. are you seeking validation from a foreign magazine you want to be do you want to be a poster boy for a foreign magazine or is it, would that be your certification to say oh this is why this is who i am mm. so first of all i had to like know my own identity i have my own art organization we have our own journal we have our magazine but i think the irony there is that i don't need to be in any magazine Mm. to show I, 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 I have some published works and some magazines but I'm not waking up every day and thinking no I have, to, I have to be I have to have my works in the Poetry Foundation I have to have my works you know in London Poetry or all of that so that doesn't give you validation you no know, it doesn't give me validation no I'm bigger than all of that mm. I'm bigger than all of that so I think so I think for some for some people they they believe that oh that is their announcement they need to get to the to get to the West to the Western media to get that renown you have to be on some platforms and all of that. Mm. And at times that could liquidate your work, liquidate your essence as well. Mm. The fact that you have to conform to some certain standards, but there are people that are out there who do not conform to standards, to, you know, to, to all of those rules where everyone is sounding alike, reading, you know, sounding the same way because we all want to, we're all aspiring to the same to thing in, yeah. because we want to fit in. So if you don't want, you know, you don't need gatekeepers, you have to learn to build yourself. Mm. You must be a builder. How how do I build myself? Yeah, so I think for me, what I did was starting out, you know, I had my own publishing imprint. So the, first of all, the Ruin Lion Your Castle was a publishing imprint. That means I'm not going to beg anyone to say, oh, please come and publish, uh, come and publish me. <laughs> so that that's out of the way. Mm. I, was also, I was also able to publish other writers as well on the same imprint. Then secondly, I built websites, built literary journals, mm. started Lion and Lilac, the Newcastle Review. Wow. platform other people as well you're building your own platform yeah building my own platforms mm. when people come to me they say oh can can you get my you know press release or get my book review on my platform i do it for them for free mm. i'm helping people as well building my own community of people so i don't really need because if you are if you need other people to help you to put you out there then you have to conform to whatever they bring your way mm. so, and you are at their mercy yeah, they are messy. Mm. But if you build your own platforms, I, I had a very successful Black History Month event last year in Newcastle. Mm -hmm. It's because I'm building. Invite artists to come perform. I get invited to shows. I get invited to events. But I also make sure. So if you're out there looking to, you know, start something yourself, what can you do within that little space? Mm -hmm. Start anyhow. Start with what you have. Don't wait for perfect conditions. Don't wait for, you know, because most times we make excuses. But for you to roll, to unravel your hidden gems, you just have to start. Don't look at, oh, you know, if it's, it has to be raining first, I need £2,000 to start this business. Mm. What do you have? How can you start? Can I start from home? Do I need an off? You know, so you just have to look at all the variables and, you know, we pick up, we pick it up from there. Mm. 
Okay, I've got two more questions for you. First, I want to look at your children book. So, so you have you've written three children books. Yeah. The three. Okay. So this is if you have to be anything, be kind. I am not a troublemaker, and I wear self confidence like a second skin. Yeah. So why did you start writing children books, and what's the message you want to put out there for them? I, yes, I have two young children, and I see the challenges you know they face growing up and. Yeah, and I believe like self-confidence and self-esteem is very important for young people. Most times, young people, they suffer from, a lot, you know, they suffer a lot, especially people in our community, black, black children, a lot of stereotyping, mm. self-esteem issues. And I feel like writing these books, teaching, not even just for black community, but for every young child, teaching them that it's very important to be self-confident, mm. to believe in yourself. And uh, whatever labels or uh, being a troublemaker is that's not who you are. And also, if you have to be anything, be kind. That's the best thing we can ever, you know, aspire to be. Rather than being wicked to people or go go online to troll people. Look, you know, just first of all think about it. What we you know the imp- the impact of my words on others and if you have to be anything. Rather, it's better. So I think it's better to cut them young as well because mm-hmm. the young children, when they are growing up, teach them the benefit of, you know, being confident in themselves, in their own abilities. So whatever talent they have, if they are confident, they are able to, like, express themselves. Teach them the benefit of kindness as well, being kind. When you are kind to other people, you wouldn't discriminate against people. You will treat everyone that comes your way fairly. So being kind should be like a... It should be a message yeah. that we teach our children growing up, even for us as adults. I remember when I was doing the book launch for this book, and my mates would then, I used to play football a lot, and my mates on the football pitch were like, Tolu, you have to be more kind on the football pitch. <laughs> <laughs> so you're not kind. <laughs> so that was, a, that was a, so it's also a message for adults as well. Mm, to be that, kind. Yeah, to be kind. If you have to be anything, be kind. So it's just, I, I wrote the children's the books to, you know, Tell young children the importance of self-confidence, mm. having good self-esteem, believing in themselves. The fact that you're a person of color or you're a young person, it doesn't mean you should not be confident. You, you can, you know, be confident in who you are. For me, being a writer, being a poet, going on stage to perform, to inspire people, showing them that it's possible, mm. is because I'm confident. I, yeah. I, you know, I've performed in big spaces. If I'm not confident, I'll, you know, but when you own that stage, you know, just look at the techniques. How can you, as a performer, as a performer as well, how mm. do you carry the audience along? When we all roll and everywhere is scattering, I'm, co- yeah, you know, I'm much more confident. Mm. People there too, they resonate with my work. So I think it's very, it's a very important message as well for our young people to be confident, and then no one would, you know, no one would step on you. Yeah, we're not gonna grow for anybody. <laughs> <laughs> I have two questions for you. Sorry. I know I said I only had two last questions. Yeah. But I have two. So my first one is, okay, you might have people out there who are watching this. Yeah. And they're thinking, oh, wow, this is an award-winning writer. Yeah. You know, how do I get to that level? What steps can I take to get to your, to the, to his level? So what um do you have for them? What steps do you have for them? What can they do to get to the level you're at now? Yeah, I think being an award, multiple award-winning writer. <laughs> multiple award-winning writer, Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think getting to that stage just means like being authentic, mm. be original in your own in your voice, mm. in your own writing. Yeah, so just just be, just be you, be original, and I think tell your story as well. Mm. And to be fair, people some people might say, "Oh, awards do not matter." I always say, "Yeah, but if you win it, it's still yours, <laughs> yeah. and it shows that people out there appreciate your work. Ap- appreciate your yes. work, appreciate what you do. So it's not like." It's not like you're seeking validation that that's the ultimate. For some, they don't really care about winning awards. Mm. But I think, you know, to win to win a book award is 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 nice. Mm. Is 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 good when you have it. But I think to to win to win an award, just be original, original thoughts, original thinking, ensure the book is properly edited, mm. because no no prize would give an award prize to a book that's not properly edited. Mm. So you know, just take your time take your time ensure it's just like you're cooking food ensure it's done properly mm. i think on the basis of because that will be the merits mm. that the award will be, will be judged on so 
that that would be the that would be the merit. So write a write a good book, you know, go go over it before before publication. Mm. And if I think some people as well, they have friends, they have peer peer reviewers, better readers, people would read it for them. So it depends on whatever works for you. Whatever works for you, basically. Okay. And what makes a best selling book? Mm. What makes a best selling book? Yeah, so well, I I'll say you know marketing and marketing does you know goes a long way mm. yeah because you can write a very good book if you don't market it get it to the get it to the consumers nobody will know about it yeah nobody will know about it yeah so marketing does a lot of that mm. and you know whichever you know people leverage on relationships on their networks if you are with a big publishing brand you know but i think the the thing is that a lot of writers do not sell more than 100 books in their lifetime Mm, why majority do not sell more than even like writers with the big publishers mm. a lot do not sell why and uh, because i um, for me i think people might not know about them mm. so so people write nobody knows you or you're not marketing enough you're not, you're not you're, yeah. you know you're not you're not selling enough people mm. you know who is your target do you know your target audience as well Mm. Who is your target audience? Who are you writing for? So I think those are some of the valid questions. But for someone like me, you know, when I started out, I had like a very good community of people. In my Facebook, I saw thousands of books. Wow. And yeah, so I had that community behind me, backing me up, supporting, supporting me. So I, I think that really that really helped. But then I go to the marketplace, people are fascinated. Who is this whiskey? Mm. Who is yeah, you know, 22 books, you've done a lot and all of that. Yeah, so people are, you know, buying the books, supporting, they buy one book, they come back. So so for you to be a best selling author, you have to you have to put in the effort, you have to know what works for you. Mm. I, I, I don't say oh because um I'm, I'm a big name or I still go to the market. Mm. I still go to the market. So that hustling Nigerian spirit is <laughs> still there. Say, yeah, I'm still hustling, still, you know, pushing, still, you know, ex- expanding the ba- boundaries, not limiting myself. And yeah, so, and, you know, the, so many opportunities will also come when you put yourself out there. Mm. I've, I, you know, even going to the market, I've had like a lot of events, festivals that, they spoke to me just from seeing me selling, your book. selling my books and oh you are the author. I say yes. Because some people will just look at you and feel like, oh, is it the shop? Is it the shop? <laughs> Who is this? <laughs> is, is this? Is this the shop? <laughs> yeah, but I think the beauty of even, you know, being a time out market for me then was that meeting a lot of strangers, people that, you know, people that would just come, uh, tourists from all around the world. Mm. who are enthralled by your literary brilliance they want to take pictures with you they want to talk to you they want to know your writing process mm. what happens to you that's a question i even want to ask <laughs> <laughs> i can't let you go from here without answering that question so what is your writing process like how do you write a book uh, so give it in step step one step two yeah yeah step one mm-hmm. there are some things that you know you can't really legislate for you can't legislate for the COVID pandemic. Mm. I wrote a collection of poems on, you know, the coronavirus pandemic. Mm. You can't legislate for grief. I wrote a, and I think that was inspired by the memory of Dr. Chinelu Megafu, mm. the doctor, medical doctor that was coming to the United Kingdom from Nigeria, and she was killed on the on, on the train. In I think that was in Cardinal when terrorists attacked the train. That was I think twenty twenty two. Yeah, so so they are so we can't actually legislate for, you know, the calamity that befalls the world for the issues that ravage us. So I think the first step is for the idea. Mm. What what's the idea? What do I want to write about? Mm. Then yeah, so that's the step one. Step the, one. What the, is the idea? Yeah, what, what is do you the want idea? to write about? What do you want to write about? Step the, two. Step two. You could have an outline. So what themes do you want to cover? Okay. What, yeah. So, what what themes do you want to cover? Can you have more than one theme? 
Yeah, it depends. Yeah, so you can you so you could say, oh, this book is broken down into four teams. It could be maybe one team sexuality, another team. It could be race relations. It could be you know so different things, gender gender related issues, all of those. It could be you know so so many teams that one could explore within. Even we talked about kindness, could be one team, self confidence, mm. self esteem. Yeah, so I have different teams around that then. Mm. Then you start writing. Then you know writing is much more accessible these days. Mm. So at times I write on my phone while you know running, jogging. Mm. At times the ideas just comes to mind. So the idea comes to mind, and I put it down later. So you, you know you've only mentioned step two steps before you go straight into writing. Yeah, you only have two steps, and then you just go straight in. Yeah, 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 wow, okay. yeah. So, so, so um, I have the idea. I do an the outline. outline. I do the outline yeah. for yeah. I do the outline. Does the outline also contain like chapters or? Yeah, yeah. So it depends. So you know, if it's if it's it could be chapter outlines. If it's a novel or short stories, mm. but if it's poetry, you, you could just break it down into sections, okay. themes that you want this to cover and all of that. Okay. Then yeah. So I think it, maybe because I'm more of like a. Uh, unconventional writer as well mm-hmm. with no formal training in writing so no formal training but you've got 22 but yeah yeah <laughs> yeah so no 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 formal training so we are we are bending the rules mm-hmm. you know well, that shows us that training is not important actually yeah, yeah so what they teach you in the creating writing schools at least i can say that i've achieved all of this without attending any, any creative them. writing school wow. so we are, we are breaking the rules because these days people People, everyone is tilting towards a particular direction, but we are showing them that yes, it's possible if you know if you follow this path. So the unconventional way, mm. what they don't teach in school, we can we can do it. We can create our own rules, do it our own way, as to mm. make it a success. I like the fact that not only you know did you create your own platform, but you know you did it your own way, yeah. telling your own unique story yeah. your own way, yeah. and for me it's just. It's brilliant because so many people are trying to force themselves into certain shapes, yeah. force themselves into certain boxes because they yeah. think, oh, if I package myself this way, yeah. you know, I'll go. And one other thing I like is that you've been in this country so long, but you're not talking with a British accent. Niger for life. Niger for life. Niger for life. I'm a big believer in the Nigerian identity. I've had like conversations with friends, people close to me that were, you know, forming British accent. I'm like, no, let's let's uphold our, you know, our Nigerian identity. Mm-hmm. We are we're first and foremost Nigerians as well. So even if the accent was to so big, I'm in Nigeria, you know. <laughs> so we need to, you know, I I I am a big believer in Nigeria. Mm-hmm. I don't have, you know, at times people say I'm I'm, I'm an angry poet. I've written a lot of angry stories, you know. I'm one who write a lot about issues that affect society, issues that plague us, you know, fighting for the black race, in black does not equal inferior, mm. you know, wearing the shoes of those that grieve and on the train to L, mm. you know, helping, you know, so just different faces of my writing, looking at issues in society, corruption, you know, the politicians doing their own <laughs> magic and all of that. And how do you, I have to ask you, what's your opinion on, you know, politicians and corruption? <laughs> Yeah, it's a. I think it's a generational like. <laughs> <it's, Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> no, like it, it, like it's been a thing. So mm-hmm. it's not just it's not new. Mm-hmm. Everyone is after their own personal interest. So, but I think you know Africa would Africa would you know would do well if we have leaders who are after more, you know, who care about the people. Mm. We are not after like stashing wealth away. Like, who are kind? Yeah, who are kind. Like, Maybe we, they need to read your book. <laughs> I, I, I know. So we see, we see them here in the in the financial services sector. In the past, you know, I've seen you know account of you know prominent people in Nigeria that you know that you see their money accounts here. Yeah, like yeah, stashed in like foreign jurisdictions. Yeah, so because you, why do you need diligence? That possibility of coming across one or two like prominent individuals who, who and you go, can't mention their names. <laughs> yeah, you, can, yeah, you, you, you cannot mention their names because it's all you know data protection and yeah. all of that. Yeah. So, but wow. yeah. So in Africa, people care a lot about personal interest. Mm. But you come to these countries like this, you see people that care for the for the people for the community. Yes. And you are doing a lot to like you know, develop this society. Help the community. Uh, yeah, but people come here, if something bad happens in America, they say, oh, 
there's shooting America. They used, you know, we talk about shooting America. Why not talk about the good happening in America, mm. the development in America? Why not bring that back home? But you know, so I think we have a lot. We have a long way to go in terms of, and uh, and I think for me, that's why you know writing has been. At times, I even blank off as well. I don't really want to watch the news back home or because at times it just messes it, with your mood it messes with your mood your, you know your, and you don't want to be this one that they just say it's just all this sad all this angry an angry poet angry <laughs> poet yeah wow. I had one book then that you know my collection of poems never played against the devil and mm. the editor wrote, so, wrote a lengthy review it was like ah what was the, that about? Uh, yeah, never yeah. against the devil. Yeah, so that was it was it was in three sections. Mm. First section was just you know uplifting, encouraging people, you know, to be the best version of themselves. Second version was more political, you know, a lot of political issues delving into answers, mm. bad governance, a copper that was killed in Kaduna. I think it was in Kaduna. Mm. So, and yeah, a lot of you know a lot of issues going on within within the political landscape. Mm. And my editor was like, don't come to Nigeria. If you come and they see this book and this and that and that. But mm. I think it's very important as writers for us to, you know, observe, recount and document these stories. Yes. Yeah, because, and even in film, in television. Mm. So they don't all, become the, forgotten. Yeah, so they don't become forgotten. Mm. And I think I've done a very good job at that I as well. I think you have you have so is there anything else you'd want to let our viewers know yeah so uh, for anyone watching us out there if you have dreams you have visions don't delay you have those gems within you you can be you can be the best version of yourself and also i think within like just to encourage your people out there as well within my career you don't always wait for opportunities as well. Yeah. So if you see a position that you aspire to, you, you aspire to, you want to get to that position, you want to get into financial crime compliance, look for a course within that space. Mm. It could be ACAMS, it could be ICA, get a course done, you know, get ready in the place of preparation. I think it's always very important mm. because most times people want a particular position, they want a particular opportunity, but in the place of preparation, are you ready? Are you ready to invest in yourself? Are you ready to pay the top dollar or the top, you know? Are you ready to invest in, in that dream that you have? Mm. So whatever, you know, don't just wait to get there, but start with what you have. Then later on, you see the stars align in your favor. Can I have a large roll like a lion? Rah. Can I have a large roll like a lion? Rah. Rah. <laughs> yeah. At this point in um in our show, um, we have a little game. I okay. have three numbers for you. One, two, and three. You have to pick a number and whatever you pick, you have to do. Uh, two. Two. Okay. <laughs> number two, you have to... Hmm. <laughs> okay, it's number two you want to. <laughs> okay, well, <number> one. <laughs> number one. Okay, yeah. that's good. <laughs> number one, you have to create a poem on the spot. The 91 feet <laughs> podcast... A sea of imagination. Wow. Can you hear the voice echo? These stories are real. Mm. They are from vulnerability. Can you see the scars? My scars, our scars. Mm. Can you see the pain painted mm. on the canvas? Mm. Of my art, can you feel the lips pause? <laughs> <laughs> this is a home of imagination, creating ideas, betting remarkable stories, vivid for the world to see. Mm. We thrive when we tell our stories. We thrive and and ascend to greater glory. Mm. Let, let me rhyme there. <laughs> <laughs> that was good, actually. I really like that. That was very creative. This is the Night One P podcast. Just come, be the cast. We are the film. We will tell your story mm. in a way that, that brings it to life. Wow. I love that. 
That was really nice. I don't know if it was nice, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, so it's been great having you in studio today. I thank you so much for taking out time from your busy schedule to share your story with viewers out there. So for those of you watching, if you enjoyed this, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And please go to the description below to find some links to Tolu's books so you could purchase some of them online. Thanks for watching. Take care. Bye. <laughs>